you need a good library. Shuf got me started on my library. Here's one of the books he recommended. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Think and Grow Rich. Shuf said to me, doesn't that book title intrigue you? Think and Grow Rich. Don't you have to read that book? Think and Grow Rich. I said, yes, sir, by Napoleon Hill. I went and found that book in a used bookstore. That's where I had to start. In a used bookstore. I paid less than 50 cents for it. I've still got it. It's one of the rare hardback covers. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Chapter 9. Persistence. The sustained effort necessary to induce faith. The eighth step toward riches. Persistence is an essential factor in the procedure of transmuting desire into its monetary equivalent. The basis of persistence is the power of will. Willpower and desire, when properly combined, make an irresistible pair. Men who accumulate great fortunes are generally known as cold-blooded and sometimes ruthless. Often they are misunderstood. What they have is willpower which they mix with persistence and place back of their desires to ensure the attainment of their objectives. Henry Ford has been generally misunderstood to be ruthless and cold-blooded. This misconception grew out of Ford's habit of following through in all of his plans with persistence. The majority of people are ready to throw their aims and purposes overboard and give up at the first sign of opposition or misfortune. A few carry on despite all opposition until they attain their goal. These few are the Fords, Carnegies, Rockefellers, and Edisons. There may be no heroic connotation to the word persistence, but the quality is to the character of man what carbon is to steel. The building of a fortune generally involves the application of the entire thirteen factors of this philosophy. These principles must be understood. They must be applied with persistence by all who accumulate money. If you are following this book with the intention of applying the knowledge it conveys, your first test as to your persistence will come when you begin to follow the six steps described in the second chapter. Unless you are one of the two out of every hundred who already have a definite goal at which you are aiming and a definite plan for its attainment, you may read the instructions and then pass on with your daily routine and never comply with those instructions. The author is checking you up at this point because lack of persistence is one of the major causes of failure. Moreover, experience with thousands of people has proved that lack of persistence is a weakness common to the majority of men. It is a weakness which may be overcome by effort. The ease with which lack of persistence may be conquered will depend entirely upon the intensity of one's desire. The starting point of all achievement is desire. Keep this constantly in mind. Weak desires bring weak results, just as a small amount of fire makes a small amount of heat. If you find yourself lacking in persistence, this weakness may be remedied by building a stronger fire under your desires. Continue to read through to the end, then go back to chapter 2 and start immediately to carry out the instructions given in connection with the six steps. The eagerness with which you follow these instructions will indicate clearly how much or how little you really desire to accumulate money. If you find that you are indifferent, you may be sure that you have not yet acquired the money consciousness which you must possess before you can be sure of accumulating a fortune. Fortunes gravitate to men whose minds have been prepared to attract them, just as surely as water gravitates to the ocean. In this book may be found all the stimuli necessary to attune any normal mind to the vibrations which will attract the object of one's desires. If you find you are weak in persistence, center your attention upon the instructions contained in the chapter on power. Surround yourself with a mastermind group, and through the cooperative efforts of the members of this group, you can develop persistence. You will find additional instructions for development of persistence in the chapters on auto-suggestion in the subconscious mind. Follow the instructions outlined in these chapters until your habit nature hands over to your subconscious mind a clear picture of the object of your desire. From that point on, you will not be handicapped by lack of persistence. Your subconscious mind works continuously while you are awake and while you are asleep. Spasmodic or occasional effort to apply the rules will be of no value to you. To get results, you must apply all of the rules until their application becomes a fixed habit with you. 
In no other way can you develop the necessary money consciousness. Poverty is attracted to the one whose mind is favorable to it, as money is attracted to him whose mind has been deliberately prepared to attract it, and through the same laws. Poverty consciousness will voluntarily seize the mind which is not occupied with the money consciousness. A poverty consciousness develops without conscious application of habits favorable to it. The money consciousness must be created to order unless one is born with such a consciousness. Catch the full significance of the statements in the preceding paragraph and you will understand the importance of persistence in the accumulation of a fortune. Without persistence, you will be defeated, even before you start. With persistence, you will win. If you have ever experienced a nightmare, you will realize the value of persistence. You are lying in bed, half awake, with a feeling that you are about to smother. You are unable to turn over or to move a muscle. You realize that you must begin to regain control over your muscles. Through persistent effort of willpower, you finally manage to move the fingers of one hand. By continuing to move your fingers, you extend your control to the muscles of one arm until you can lift it. Then you gain control of the other arm in the same manner. You finally gain control over the muscles of one leg and then extend it to the other leg. Then, with one supreme effort of will, you regain complete control over your muscular system and snap out of your nightmare. The trick has been turned step by step. You may find it necessary to snap out of your mental inertia through a similar procedure moving slowly at first and then increasing your speed until you gain complete control over your will. Be persistent no matter how slowly you may at first have to move. With persistence will come success. If you select your mastermind group with care, you will have in it at least one person who will aid you in the development of persistence. Some men who have accumulated great fortunes did so because of necessity. They developed the habit of persistence because they were so closely driven by circumstances that they had to become persistent. There is no substitute for persistence. It cannot be supplanted by any other quality. Remember this, and it will hearten you in the beginning when the going may seem difficult and slow. Those who have cultivated the habit of persistence seem to enjoy insurance against failure. No matter how many times they are defeated, they finally arrive up toward the top of the ladder. Sometimes it appears that there is a hidden guide whose duty is to test men through all sorts of discouraging experiences. Those who pick themselves up after defeat and keep on trying arrive, and the world cries, Bravo! I knew you could do it. The hidden guide lets no one enjoy great achievement without passing the persistence test. Those who can't take it simply do not make the grade. Those who can take it are bountifully rewarded for their persistence. They receive as their compensation whatever goal they are pursuing. That is not all. They receive something infinitely more important than material compensation, the knowledge that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. There are exceptions to this rule. A few people know from experience the soundness of persistence. They are the ones who have not accepted defeat as being anything more than temporary. They are the ones whose desires are so persistently applied that defeat is finally changed into victory. We who stand on the sidelines of life see the overwhelmingly large number who go down in defeat, never to rise again. We see the few who take the punishment of defeat as an urge to greater effort. These fortunately never learn to accept life's reverse gear. But what we do not see, what most of us never suspect of existing, is the silent but irresistible power which comes to the rescue of those who fight on in the face of discouragement. If we speak of this power at all, we call it persistence and let it go at that. One thing we all know, if one does not possess persistence, one does not achieve noteworthy success in any calling. As these lines are being written, I look up from my work and see before me, less than a block away, the great mysterious Broadway, the graveyard of dead hopes, and the front porch of opportunity. From all over the world, people have come to Broadway seeking fame, fortune, power, love, or whatever it is that human beings call success. Once in a great while, someone steps out from the long procession of seekers and the world hears that another person has mastered Broadway. 
but Broadway is not easily nor quickly conquered. She acknowledges talent, recognizes genius, pays off in money only after one has refused to quit. Then we know he has discovered the secret of how to conquer Broadway. The secret is always inseparably attached to one word, persistence. The secret is told in the struggle of Fanny Hurst, whose persistence conquered the Great White Way. She came to New York in 1915 to convert writing into riches. The conversion did not come quickly, but it came. For four years Miss Hurst learned about the sidewalks of New York from first-hand experience. She spent her days laboring and her nights hoping. When hope grew dim, she did not say, All right, Broadway, you win. She said, Very well, Broadway, you may whip some, but not me. I'm going to force you to give up. One publisher, the Saturday Evening Post, sent her 36 rejection slips before she broke the ice and got a story across. The average writer, like the average in other walks of life, would have given up the job when the first rejection slip came. She pounded the pavements for four years to the tune of the publisher's no, because she was determined to win. Then came the payoff. The spell had been broken. The unseen guide had tested Fanny Hurst, and she could take it. From that time on, publishers made a beaten path to her door. Money came so fast she hardly had time to count it. Then the moving picture men discovered her, and money came not in small change but in floods. The moving picture rights to her latest novel, Great Laughter, brought $100,000, said to be the highest price ever paid for a story before publication. Her royalties from the sale of the book probably will run much more. Briefly, you have a description of what persistence is capable of achieving. Fanny Hurst is no exception. Wherever men and women accumulate great riches, you may be sure they first acquired persistence. Broadway will give any beggar a cup of coffee and a sandwich, but it demands persistence of those who go after the big stakes. Kate Smith will say amen when she reads this. For years she sang without money and without price before any microphone she could reach. Broadway said to her, Come and get it if you can take it. She did take it until one happy day... Broadway got tired and said, Ah, what's the use? You don't know when you're whipped, so name your price and go to work in earnest. Myth Smith named the price. It was plenty. A way up in figures so high that one's week's salary is far more than most people make in a whole year. Verily, it pays to be persistent. Persistence is a state of mind, therefore it can be cultivated. Like all states of mind, persistence is based upon definite causes, among them, these. A. Definiteness of purpose. Knowing what one wants is the first and perhaps the most important step toward the development of persistence. A strong motive forces one to surmount many difficulties. B. Desire. It is comparatively easy to acquire and to maintain persistence in pursuing the object of intense desire. C. Self-reliance. Belief in one's ability to carry out a plan encourages one to follow the plan through with persistence. Self-reliance can be developed through the principle described in the chapter on auto-suggestion. D. Definiteness of plans. Organized plans, even though they may be weak and entirely impractical, encourage persistence. E. Accurate knowledge. Knowing that one's plans are sound, based upon experience or observation, encourages persistence. Guessing, instead of knowing, destroys persistence. F. Cooperation. Sympathy, understanding, and harmonious cooperation with others tend to develop persistence. G. Willpower. The habit of concentrating one's thoughts upon the building of plans for the attainment of a definite purpose leads to persistence. H. Habit. Persistence is the direct result of habit. The mind absorbs and becomes a part of the daily experiences upon which it feeds. Fear, the worst of all enemies, can be effectively cured by forced repetition of acts of courage. Everyone who has seen active service in war knows this. Before leaving the subject of persistence, take inventory of yourself and determine in what particular, if any, you are lacking in this essential quality. Measure yourself courageously, 
point by point and see how many of the eight factors of persistence you lack. The analysis may lead to discoveries that will give you a new grip on yourself. Symptoms of Lack of Persistence Here you will find the real enemies which stand between you and noteworthy achievement. Here you will find not only the symptoms indicating weakness of persistence, but also the deeply seated subconscious causes of this weakness. Study the list carefully and face yourself squarely if you really wish to know who you are and what you are capable of doing. These are the weaknesses which must be mastered by all who accumulate riches. 1. Failure to recognize and to clearly define exactly what one wants. 2. Procrastination with or without cause, usually backed up with a formidable array of alibis and excuses. 3. Lack of interest in acquiring specialized knowledge. 4. Indecision, the habit of passing the buck on all occasions instead of facing issues squarely, also backed by alibis. 5. The habit of relying upon alibis instead of creating definite plans for the solution of problems. 6. Self-satisfaction. There is but little remedy for this affliction and no hope for those who suffer from it. 7. Indifference, usually reflected in one's readiness to compromise on all occasions rather than meet opposition and fight it. 8. The habit of blaming others for one's mistakes and accepting unfavorable circumstances as being unavoidable. 9. Weakness of desire, due to neglect in the choice of motives that impel action. 10. Willingness, even eagerness, to quit at the first sign of defeat, based upon one or more of the six basic fears. 11. Lack of organized plans placed in writing where they may be analyzed. 12. The habit of neglecting to move on ideas or to grasp opportunity when it presents itself. 13. Wishing instead of willing. 14. The habit of compromising with poverty instead of aiming at riches. General absence of ambition to be, to do, and to own. 15. Searching for all the shortcuts to riches, trying to get without giving a fair equivalent, usually reflected in the habit of gambling, endeavoring to drive sharp bargains. 16. Fear of criticism. Failure to create plans and to put them into action because of what other people will think, do, or say. This enemy belongs at the head of the list because it generally exists in one subconscious mind where its presence is not recognized. See the six basic fears in a later chapter. Let us examine some of the symptoms of the fear of criticism. The majority of people permit relatives, friends, and the public at large to so influence them that they cannot live their own lives because they fear criticism. Huge numbers of people make mistakes in marriage, stand by the bargain, and go through life miserable and unhappy because they fear criticism which may follow if they correct the mistake. Anyone who has submitted to this form of fear knows the irreparable damage it does by destroying ambition, self-reliance, and the desire to achieve. Millions of people neglect to acquire belated educations after having left school because they fear criticism. Countless numbers of men and women, both young and old, permit relatives to wreck their lives in the name of duty because they fear criticism. Duty does not require any person to submit to the destruction of his personal ambitions and the right to live his own life in his own way. People refuse to take chances in business because they fear the criticism which may follow if they fail. The fear of criticism in such cases is stronger than the desire for success. Too many people refuse to set high goals for themselves or even neglect selecting a career because they fear the criticism of relatives and friends who may say, don't aim so high, people will think you are crazy. When Andrew Carnegie suggested that I devote 20 years to the organization of a philosophy of individual achievement, my first impulse of thought was fear of what people might say. The suggestion set up a goal for me, far out of proportion to any I had ever conceived. As quick as a flash, my mind began to create alibis and excuses, all of them traceable to the inherent fear of criticism. Something inside of me said, you can't do it. The job is too big and requires too much time. What will your relatives think of you? How will you earn a living? No one has ever organized a philosophy of success. What right have you to believe you can do it? Who are you, anyway, to aim so high? Remember your humble birth. What do you know about philosophy? People will think you are crazy, and they did. 
Why hasn't some other person done this before now? These and many other questions flashed into my mind and demanded attention. It seemed as if the whole world had suddenly turned its attention to me with the purpose of ridiculing me into giving up all the desire to carry out Mr. Carnegie's suggestion. I had a fine opportunity then and there to kill off ambition before it gained control of me. Later in life, after having analyzed thousands of people, I discovered that most ideas are stillborn and need the breath of life injected into them through definite plans of immediate action. The time to nurse an idea is at the time of its birth. Every minute it lives gives it a better chance of surviving. The fear of criticism is at the bottom of the destruction of most ideas which never reach the planning and action stage. Many people believe that material success is the result of favorable breaks. There is an element of ground for that belief, but those depending entirely upon luck are nearly always disappointed, because they overlook another important factor which must be present before one can be sure of success. It is the knowledge with which favorable breaks can be made to order. During the Depression, W. C. Fields, the comedian, lost all his money and found himself without income, without a job and his means of earning a living. Vaudeville no longer existed. Moreover, he was past sixty when many men considered themselves old. He was so eager to stage a comeback that he offered to work without pay in a new field, movies. In addition to his other troubles, he fell and injured his neck. To many, that would have been the place to give up and quit. But Fields was persistent. He knew that if he carried on, he would get the break sooner or later, and he did get them, but not by chance. Marie Dresler found herself down and out with her money gone with no job when she was about sixty. She, too, went after the breaks and got them. Her persistence brought an astounding triumph late in life, long beyond the age when most men and women are done with ambition to achieve. Eddie Cantor lost his money in the 1929 stock crash, but he still had his persistence and his courage. With these, plus two prominent eyes, he exploited himself back into an income of 10000 a week. Verily, if one has persistence, one can get along very well without many other qualities. The only break anyone can afford to rely upon is a self-made break. These come through the application of persistence. The starting point is definiteness of purpose. Examine the first hundred people you meet. Ask them what they want most in life, and ninety-eight of them will not be able to tell you. If you press them for an answer, some will say security. Many will say money. A few will say happiness. Others will say fame and power. And still others will say social recognition, ease in living, ability to sing, dance, or write. But none of them will be able to define these terms or give the slightest indication of a plan by which they hope to attain these vaguely expressed wishes. Riches do not respond to wishes. They respond only to definite plans backed by definite desires through constant persistence. How to Develop Persistence There are four simple steps which lead to the habit of persistence. They call for no great amount of intelligence, no particular amount of education, and but little time or effort. The necessary steps are 1. A definite purpose backed by burning desire for its fulfillment. 2. A definite plan expressed in continuous action. 3. A mind closed tightly against all negative and discouraging influences, including negative suggestions of relatives, friends, and acquaintances. 4. A friendly alliance with one or more persons who will encourage one to follow through with both plan and purpose. These four steps are essential for success in all walks of life. The entire purpose of the thirteen principles of this philosophy is to enable one to take these four steps as a matter of habit. These are the steps by which one may control one's economic destiny. They are the steps that lead to freedom and independence of thought. They are the steps that lead to riches in small or great quantities. They lead the way to power, fame, and worldly recognition. They are the four steps which guarantee favorable breaks. They are the steps that convert dreams into physical realities. They lead also to the mastery of fear, discouragement, indifference. There is a magnificent reward for all who learn to take these four steps. It is the privilege of writing one's own ticket and of making life yield whatever price is asked. I have no way of knowing the facts, but I venture to conjecture that Mrs. Wallace Simpson's great love for a man was not accidental. 
nor the result of favorable breaks alone. There was a burning desire and careful searching at every step of the way. Her first duty was to love. What is the greatest thing on earth? The master called it love, not man-made rules, criticism, bitterness, slander, or political marriages, but love. She knew what she wanted, not after she met the Prince of Wales, but long before that. Twice when she had failed to find it, she had the courage to continue her search. To thine own self be true, and it must follow, as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Her rise from obscurity was of the slow, progressive, persistent order, but it was sure. She triumphed over unbelievably long odds, and no matter who you are, or what you may think of Wallace Simpson, or the king who gave up his crown for her love, she is an astounding example of applied persistence, an instructor on the rules of self-determination, from whom the entire world might profitably take lessons. When you think of Wallace Simpson, think of one who knew what she wanted, and shook the greatest empire on earth to get it. Women who complain that this is a man's world, that women do not have an equal chance to win, owe it to themselves to study carefully the life of this unusual woman, who at an age when most women consider old, captured the affections of the most desirable bachelor in the entire world. And what of King Edward? What lesson may we learn from his part in the world's greatest drama of recent times? Did he pay too high a price for the affections of the woman of his choice? Surely no one but he can give the correct answer. The rest of us can only conjecture. This much we know. The king came into the world without his own consent. He was born to great riches without requesting them. He was persistently sought in marriage. Politicians and statesmen throughout Europe tossed dowagers and princesses at his feet. Because he was the firstborn of his parents, he inherited a crown which he did not seek, and perhaps did not desire. For more than forty years he was not a free agent, could not live his life in his own way, had but little privacy, and finally assumed duties inflicted upon him when he ascended the throne. Some will say, with all these blessings, King Edward should have found peace of mind, contentment, and joy of living. The truth is that back of all the privileges of a crown, all the money, the fame, and the power inherited by King Edward, there was an emptiness which could be filled only by love. His greatest desire was for love. Long before he met Wallace Simpson, he doubtless felt this great universal emotion tugging at the strings of his heart, beating upon the door of his soul and crying out for expression. And when he met a kindred spirit crying out for this same holy privilege of expression, he recognized it, and without fear or apology opened his heart and bade it enter. All the scandal-mongers in the world cannot destroy the beauty of this international drama through which two people found love and had the courage to face open criticism, renounce all else to give it holy expression. King Edward's decision to give up the crown of the world's most powerful empire for the privilege of going the remainder of the way through life with the woman of his choice was a decision that required courage. The decision also had a price, but who has the right to say the price was too great? Surely not he who said, He among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. As a suggestion to any evil-minded person who chooses to find fault with the Duke of Windsor, because his desire was for love and for openly declaring his love for Wallace Simpson, and giving up his throne for her, let it be remembered that the open declaration was not essential. He could have followed the custom of clandestine liaison, which has prevailed in Europe for centuries without giving up either his throne or the woman of his choice, and there would have been no complaint from either church or laity. But this unusual man was built of sterner stuff. His love was clean. It was deep and sincere. It represented the one thing which, above all else, he truly desired— Therefore, he took what he wanted and paid the price demanded. If Europe had been blessed with more rulers with the human heart and the traits of honesty of ex-King Edward, for the past century that unfortunate hemisphere, now seething with greed, hate, lust, political connivance, and threats of war, would have a different and a better story to tell, a story in which love and not hate would rule. In the words of Stuart Austin Weir, we raise our cup and drink this toast to ex-King Edward and Wallace Simpson. 
Blessed is the man who has come to know that our muted thoughts are our sweetest thoughts. Blessed is the man who from the blackest depths can see the luminous figure of love, and seeing, sing, and singing say, Sweeter far than uttered lays are the thoughts I have of you. In these words would we pay tribute to the two people who, more than all others of modern times, have been the victims of criticism and the recipients of abuse, because they found life's greatest treasure and claimed it. Asterisk. Mrs. Simpson read and approved this analysis. Most of the world will applaud the Duke of Windsor and Wallace Simpson because of their persistence in searching until they found life's greatest reward. All of us can profit by following their example in our own search for that which we demand of life. What mystical power gives to men of persistence the capacity to master difficulties? Does the quality of persistence set up in one's mind some form of spiritual, mental, or chemical activity which gives one access to supernatural forces? Does infinite intelligence throw itself on the side of the person who still fights on after the battle has been lost, with the whole world on the opposing side? These and many other similar questions have arisen in my mind as I have observed men like Henry Ford, who started at scratch and built an industrial empire of huge proportions with little else in the way of a beginning but persistence, or Thomas A. Edison, who with less than three months of schooling became the world's leading inventor and converted persistence into the talking machine, the moving picture machine, and the incandescent light, to say nothing of half a hundred other useful inventions. I had the happy privilege of analyzing both Mr. Edison and Mr. Ford year by year over a long period of years, and therefore the opportunity to study them at close range, so I speak from actual knowledge when I say that I found no quality save persistence in either of them that even remotely suggested the major source of their stupendous achievements. As one makes an impartial study of the prophets, philosophers, miracle men, and religious leaders of the past, one is drawn to the inevitable conclusion that persistence, concentration of effort, and definiteness of purpose were the major sources of their achievements. Consider, for example, the strange and fascinating story of Muhammad. Analyze his life, compare him with men of achievement in this modern age of industry and finance, and observe how they have one outstanding trait in common, persistence. If you are keenly interested in studying the strange power which gives potency to persistence, Read a biography of Muhammad, especially the one by Asad Bai. This brief review of that book by Thomas Sugru in the Herald Tribune will provide a preview of the rare treat in store for those who take the time to read the entire story of one of the most astounding examples of the power of persistence known to civilization. The Last Great Prophet, reviewed by Thomas Sugru. Mohammed was a prophet, but he never performed a miracle. He was not a mystic, he had no formal schooling, he did not begin his mission until he was forty. When he announced that he was the messenger of God, bringing the word of the true religion, he was ridiculed and labeled a lunatic. Children tripped him, and women threw filth upon him. He was banished from his native city, Mecca, and his followers were stripped of their worldly goods and sent into the desert after him. When he had been preaching ten years, he had nothing to show for it but banishment, poverty, and ridicule. Yet before another ten years had passed, he was dictator of all Arabia, ruler of Mecca, and the head of a new world religion which was to sweep to the Danube and the Pyrenees before exhausting the impetus he gave it. That impetus was threefold, the power of words, the efficacy of prayer, and man's kinship with God. His career never made sense. Muhammad was born to impoverished members of a leading family of Mecca. Because Mecca, the crossroads of the world, home of the magic stone called the Kaaba, great city of trade and the center of trade routes, was unsanitary, its children were sent to be raised in the desert by Bedouins. Muhammad was thus nurtured, drawing strength and health from the milk of nomad, vicarious mothers. He tended sheep and soon hired out to a rich widow as leader of her caravans. He traveled to all parts of the eastern world, talked with many men of diverse beliefs, and observed the decline of Christianity into warring sects. When he was twenty-eight, Kajia, the widow, looked upon him with favor and married him. Her father would have objected to such a marriage, so she got him drunk and held him up while he gave the paternal blessing. 
For the next twelve years, Mohammed lived as a rich and respected and very shrewd trader. Then he took to wandering in the desert, and one day he returned with the first verse of the Koran and told Kaja that the archangel Gabriel had appeared to him and said that he was to be the messenger of God. The Koran, the revealed word of God, was the closest thing to a miracle in Muhammad's life. He had not been a poet, he had no gift of words. Yet the verses of the Koran, as he received them and recited them to the faithful, were better than any verses which the professional poets of the tribes could produce. This, to the Arabs, was a miracle. To them, the gift of words was the greatest gift. The poet was all-powerful. In addition, the Koran said that all men were equal before God, that the world should be a democratic state. Islam. It was this political heresy, plus Muhammad's desire to destroy all the 360 idols in the courtyard of the Kaaba, which brought about his banishment. The idols brought the desert tribes to Mecca, and that meant trade. So the businessmen of Mecca, the capitalists of which he had been one, set upon Muhammad. Then he retreated to the desert and demanded sovereignty over the world. The rise of Islam began. Out of the desert came a flame which would not be extinguished, a democratic army fighting as a unit and prepared to die without wincing. Mohammed had invited the Jews and Christians to join him, for he was not building a new religion. He was calling all who believed in one God to join in a single faith. If the Jews and Christians had accepted his invitation, Islam would have conquered the world. They didn't. They would not even accept Mohammed's invitation of humane warfare. When the armies of the Prophet entered Jerusalem, not a single person was killed because of his faith. When the Crusaders entered the city centuries later, not a Muslim man, woman, or child was spared. But the Christians did accept one Muslim idea, the place of learning, the university.